Our next speaker is um, Simon Eurster, a man that I got to know a couple of years ago. He um, is South African born. I think he comes from Cape Town. A Ronde Bosch High School uh, product. Um, not quite Pretoria Boys High, but nonetheless, I'll forgive you for that. Uh, um, Simon's from Cape Town. He then went to the States for a couple of years. Um, a very gifted tennis player, and it wasn't a tennis scholarship that he initially went. Um, he then stayed there for around 12 years where he worked. And then in that time also completed studies at Westminster Seminary West. The Lord directed his paths back to South Africa with his American wife, Dina, and their two children. And he now ministers in the Reformed Church's uh, southern suburbs as part of the um, Belleville Gierkar Church. He has subsequently done his doctorate through Stellenbosch and is a keen church planter in terms of reformed and confessional church planting. And so without much further ado, Simon, could I invite you to come forward and address us. Thank you, Arthur, for the, the kind introduction. Please signal to me if I'm, I'm getting a bit too loud. I can tend to get a bit excited at times, and so just tell me to tone it down if, if it's getting a little uncomfortable for you. But it really is an, an honor, a privilege to be able to address you this morning. It's... Uh, it's been fantastic to be able to, to get to know my brother Thomas over the last few weeks as we've discussed our respective addresses. And I think what we've had is a microcosm of what I hope uh, will be the fruit of, of this conference and will be a ripple effect in the broader denomination, and that is grappling through together what it means to, to be church, um, but more specifically what it means to, to plant healthy, uh, multicultural churches in, in our denomination. I want to begin by reading to you uh, two sections from 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 2. 1 Corinthians 1 uh, verse 18. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved... It is the power of God. And jumping down to verse 22, For Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Verse 2 of chapter 2, for I decided to know nothing among you except Christ, Jesus Christ, and him crucified. I think these are good verses to tuck in the back of our minds as, as we wrestle together over the next few minutes about what it means to, to be reformed, confessional, as we go about church planting in a multicultural setting. Just a little bit more about uh, my background. I want to emphasize that I am not standing here as a confessionally reformed minister uh, 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 as a result of growing up in the reformed church. I'm not a dorper. I'm an outsider. I have the Afrikaans last name. I'm a bit of a mutt. Uh, but I, you know, I, I grew up high Anglican and then, and then spent two years as a Roman Catholic in the United States before exercising faith when I was 19. And it was, it was almost instantaneous that I had this desire as a 19-year-old uh, college students in, in really uh, one of the, oh, I shouldn't say armpits of North America, that my wife would find that so insulting, but it's a scaled down version of Las Vegas and, 
And here I have a passion to want to preach the gospel. I want to just come back to South Africa, be a missionary. And it took 15 years, effectively, before I, I realized that dream. And, and, and during that time, became, went from charismatic to uh, free, evangelical free, to reform Baptist, and then finally coming around, seeing the light as a, a Presbyterian. So I don't take my journey for granted. It's, it, there's a lot uh, of uh, passion, a lot of appreciation for, for where I am today. I've wrestled long and hard. But I hope I'm sympathetic as a result, too, to folk who are at different stages of that journey. And one of the delights I have in, in planting a, a, a new church is meeting folk from these different backgrounds and being empathetic, uh, being patient uh, as they grow in God's grace. We as a Reformed Church Southern Suburbs have been, have been about at the work since 2012, and the Lord has, I think, borne uh, some considerable fruit since then, and yet we're not anywhere close to being uh, self-sustaining, but Lord willing, that will happen sooner than later. What I'd like to do is, uh, this morning, argue that the mission of the church is centered around the marks of the church, which we find in Belgic 29, which is the execution of the keys to the kingdom of heaven, which we confess in the Heidelberg Catechism. In other words, the Great Commission is about discipleship, but even more specifically about making worshipers out of sinners for the glory of God. That's what I want to bring home to you this morning. God works through his church to accomplish uh, these ends. Remembering that the three marks center around our corporate worship. I'm going to proceed by first considering with you some of the challenges that, that I've experienced as, a, as an outsider ministering to folk from, from non-Afrikaans backgrounds and then uh, give you something of a reformed or confessional vision for church planting. And then finally, how do we gauge that success? And I think much of what Thomas said uh, rings true for me, uh, especially on this last point, so I won't belabor it. I also want to flag right at the beginning three themes that I want to weave in throughout my address. And the one, the one is that we, we can't go about church planting without forms, like preaching, sacraments, church discipline. Uh, but we also can't go about church planting without substance, which is the gospel. We need form and substance. Uh, second, I want to juxtapose these uh, two approaches to Christianity. One, on the one hand, pietism or pietism, as uh, Thomas puts it, and confessionalism on the other hand, or being confessional. And third, a theology of the cross and a theology of glory. I, I pray, as I said uh, a few moments ago, that the outcome would be for us all to grow in unity. We are fellow pilgrims, aren't we? We're all struggling. We're all suffering, carrying various crosses. Ministry is not easy. And yet here we have God's grace given to us uh, through the means of his church uh, so that we might make it to the end. So may, may we all grow in repentance and faith uh, towards that end of being united around the truth of God's word so that yeah, we would be more zealous, more enthusiastic about the Great Commission than before. So what I'd like to do now is for a few moments consider some of those unique challenges as, as a Reformed church, but from a white English speaking uh, background. And certainly, I don't want, I'm not excluding, uh, I hope I'm not excluding any, anyone here this morning. Uh, but I think it's interesting and it's helpful to get this perspective. And I want to list out a number of challenges that I have gleaned from speaking with folk who've become members of our church by reading, by observing, sitting in coffee shops, brushing shoulders with believers and unbelievers alike. So the first one is, and I think we'll all agree that that we're wrestling, grappling with life as a church in a post-Christendom context, a post-apartheid uh, 
context. And we're, we're having to, wrestling to make sense of what does it mean to be a Christian uh, with a liberal uh, constitution, uh, the witness of the church, including the Reformed Church, has, has lost something of its uh, traction. It used to have the ear of the state, really. Uh, um, and so I think the temptation is to panic and ask ourselves, how can we remain influential and, and relevant? And in, doing, in answering that question, to accommodate the gospel in an unhealthy way to our broader culture through uh, ingesting, a uh, 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 buying into ideologies, uh, preferences that are not uh, scriptural but rather worldly. I agree with a certain uh, definition of contextualization, so please don't hear me saying that I don't think we should be sympathetic to reaching folk in language and forms that they can understand. Uh, but that's, that's a tangent I'm not going to get into now. A second challenge that ties in closely to the first is a, a cultural progressivism. Uh, so we're, we're, we're trying to swim in a midst of, of ideological isms. So we've got humanism, for example, feminism, egalitarianism, pragmatism. It's not easy to plant a church or be a church in the midst of these pressures. And we have to press back against this, don't we? Third, we live in a culture of therapeutic narcissism. Narcissism is a big word. It's basically uh, a self-centeredness, a concern with one's own uh, uh, gratification, selfish ambition, lust after, material worth, so on and so forth. I mean, let's face it, you just look at the billboards, the screens that we're inundated with, and it's all about comfort, easy fixes, instant gratification. There's also this obsession with the next big thing. Um, you know, you've got to live an extraordinary life. Uh, there's an exaltation of youth and novelty and so on. And so it can be very difficult to even be a pastor in, in this context. People don't respect authority to begin with. And so uh, once upon a time, being a Dermany was, you know, you were someone of stature. Uh, now, that had it, perhaps had its own problems, and uh, Dermanese could be, be oppressive and, and, and could use their power in, 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 in bad ways. But it's not, dif it's not easy to, to minister in a culture of this therapeutic narcissism. Again, closely related, and they cluster together. Consumerism. People come into our churches. I was saying to Thomas last night, we've had hundreds of people come through our doors since 2012, and we've only retained a small fraction. There's people are coming, they're shopping around. What can you do for me? And they're, they're coming in with tastes, preferences that have been shaped by the world. And we've got to deal with that. We've got to think through how do we minister to such folk. We live in a, a, a technological age, don't we? I think this could, this could be a conference in and of itself. We're so distracted, split-focused, because of the inundation of the internet, social media, and so on and so forth. It is not easy to even worship coming out of that cacophony of noises and images and so on, uh, let alone pray. Uh, think deeply. I mean, we, we do have to think deeply about church planting, don't we? But it's, it's not easy when we're used to little nuggets, uh, the, the executive summary, and then we click a hyperlink and we're onto another page. So, so we have to press in against that as well. I see that as a real challenge. And I think that would go for any <laughs> ethnic group. I want to just pull, slow down and, and camp out on my sixth challenge, unique challenge. And I think this, is, this will permeate all ethnicities. And that is the legacy of pietism and revivalism. If I don't do justice here to defining it well, we can come back to, the, to this in the Q&A. But I want to just give you a sort of a bird's eye view of what do I mean by that? Uh, pietism is something that, that was essentially bequeathed to us as a result of the 17th century uh, German reformed uh, Lutheran uh, reflection on the faith. But it, but it also gained popularity among the English Puritans, you also see it among uh, the Dutch Calvinists, especially the Second Reformation, uh, the, the 
17th century Scottish Presbyterians. Uh, in terms of, of, of a desire to see renewal within the church, uh, uh, no doubt a sincere desire, uh, but meeting that need in ways that we would be critical of as uh, confessionally reformed Christians. You see uh, the development of this in North America with the two great awakenings. We see it as well in our context uh, with the likes of the Dutch Reformed Church and Andrew Murray in particular. You know, I don't have the time to unpack all of this for you. I'm just giving you a really brief uh, thumbnail sketch of, of the history. We can come back to this, but here are some of the characteristics. One is a self-centered, subjective rendering of the Christian faith or the Christian life to the expense of the life of the church. So you've got a, an exaltation of the conversion experience, private acts of devotion. You've got a view of the church that is, can be described as low. The church is not uh, out of the picture altogether, but there is a, a more of a desire to get involved in movements and causes outside of the church which are private, but also uh, driven by desires to see society changed, reformed, transformed. So you will find among those who are sympathetic to this pietistic, revivalistic uh, a legacy, interest in parachurch organizations which don't have ecclesiastical oversight, a tendency to reduce Christianity just to a few bare essentials so that there might be unity, but getting to church and how church is practiced, and I think this touches on very importantly on what we're doing as church planters, is being, being uh, suspicious of, concerned with the means, the forms that have been employed in the past because they don't produce the results that, that they're hoping for. So you will see among the Methodists, for example, the generation of, of, of these groups called holy clubs, where sort of a church within a church, uh, because supposedly the broader church is not doing a good enough work. And so they form a, a subculture that is supposedly more holy and zealous. And as a result, uh, the, the life of the church is, is, is focused on, again, uh, those activities outside of the three marks of a true church. Another characteristic, and certainly this is not exhaustive, uh, and, it, and it follows closely of what I've just said in the last few moments, is a suspicion, and I want to really highlight this, a suspicion of forms. So a suspicion of even a, a duomeny standing up and saying, I'm going to preach to you now from the word of God. God has given me authority to do so. A, a, a downplaying of the importance of the sacraments as a means of grace you know, rendering them in a non-sacramental way, being suspicious of even the notion of office uh, and church governance in general. These are, instead of seeing them as conveyors of God's grace, the way is chosen to serve us, they are seen as barriers to true spiritual vitality. So this, this pietistic, revivalistic, and we could say radical evangelical approach uh, to doing church uh, could be summed up like this. There is a, no doubt, sincere desire to be followers of Christ, but having at the same time a real suspicion towards uh, rites, ceremonies, church governance, the institutional church, and putting the accent on the private, uh, the, the social activism side of Christianity. These kind of folk will no doubt look at what we have in our tradition as, you know, you folk are guilty of a cold traditionalism. I, don't think, I think there's some merit to that critique, and I will come back to that in a few moments. But with that now in mind, and I think that's a very important challenge that, that I've seen on the ground, folk coming from mainline, Dutch Reformed churches, Anglican, Presbyterian, as well as your mega churches, they're suspicious of 
even the fact that I would call myself a duomini, a reverend, that we actually have church membership, that we, that we are concerned about office, and so on and so forth. Now, there are a number of other challenges that I, I, I just, I don't want to lose my time here. Legalism. I think we can all relate. And I think it ties into what I just spoke to regarding traditionalism. It's real. And I think that we within uh, our church denomination, and I can speak about my former churches that are Reformed and Presbyterian in the States, I think we, we really set ourselves up for legalism because we're so concerned about forms, church governance. But that church governance must be informed by the Word of God. And we cannot bind people's consciences to anything that is uh, extra-biblical. And if it's not motivated by the gospel, if the gospel is not there, we don't have a true church anyway. You can have a well-oiled church governance. And if the gospel is not there, you don't have a church. And so I'm sympathetic. Uh, Thomas and I have talked at length spoken with Kriffel as well in the past, that you, know, you can't have the forms without the substance. So please hear me accent that. It is so important. So when we come to sort of just wrapping up this point, I think that whether it be your liberals or progressives from your mainline churches that are, that are sort of really pushing the envelope in terms of, of accommodating the gospel to broader pop culture, as, as well as your fundamentalists, if you will, those who are you know, concerned about things like, well, you can't be, well, they might say you can't be a Christian if you're not homeschooling your kids, for example. You cannot be a Christian if you're not sending your kids to a Christian university. You can't be a Christian if you vote for this or that person. You can't be a Christian if you smoke or chew or girls, go with girls who do. You know, that, both of those groups will... I think are in danger on the one hand of, a, of the bane of revivalism and pietism on the one hand. So you're ignoring the forms that God has ordained, but then there's also the danger of a legalism or a traditionalism that you know, one can fall into on the other side of the road. So I think we, none of us sitting here this morning uh, is exempt from critical self-reflection. And again, this, I, I've benefited so much from from chatting with other colleagues, ministers and elders about these things, wrestling through them, seeing my blind spots. And, and I pray that, that's, that that would be the result of our time again this morning. Now I'd like to, you know, sort of getting past the bad news. Well, I mean, the Heidelberg Catechism goes from guilt to grace to gratitude. So we kind of, the guilt trip is over now. <laughs> Let's get on to the grace. And this, so my second point is cultivating a reformational vision for fulfilling the Great Commission and defining that mission in terms of the keys to the kingdom of heaven and the marks of a true church. Now, I'm going to assume a lot here. And if, if I've completely missed you on some of this, please ask during the Q&A. Uh, but I'm, I have to assume a fair amount. Otherwise, I could ne I'll never get through this point in like 15 minutes. There's a distinctiveness about our Reformed tradition, isn't it? And therefore, how we approach church planting. Uh, and that, that approach is distinct from a low church or evangelical progressive model. So different from the left and also different from a, a fundamentalist right. We are confessional. doesn't mean that we exalt the three forms of unity above Scripture. No, they're always subject to the norming critique of Scripture. But because we are confessional, it means that we don't read Scripture in a vacuum. Everyone has a confession, whether they want to admit it or not. We're just open about what we believe, and we read Scripture, therefore, in conversation with the past. And so, I think what we have in the best of our Reformed Church history is this confessional uh, approach to being church. I think a lot of what Thomas said in his address in terms of, 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 of the weaknesses, in terms of being mis missions-minded, evangelistic, outward-focused, is, is, is well-heeded. But I think there's a lot of richness in our tradition as well. I think historically we've had 
a high view of the church. We've placed worship at front and center of our piety, of our, our discipleship. Another way of describing us is liturgical. In other words, we, uh, we are concerned not only with the content of our worship services, but how the content of that worship service uh, plays out in all spheres of life. If preaching and the sacraments and church governance doesn't have implications for how we live life outside of Sunday, well, then then we've got problems. But again, the the real action is not, uh, brothers and sisters, in my opinion, and I think this is within the confessional reformed tradition, what happens on a Wednesday night in a home group. And I'm not saying that they're bad in and of themselves. It's not what happens on a Friday when you go and pick it at an abortion clinic. It's not what happens uh, even when you're with your family doing uh, uh, private family devotions. Good, but good in and of itself. It's we come together and we engage in the powers of the age to come where God serves us with his gifts through the means of grace. Worship is an end in itself and it's what we will do for eternity. And it arguably brings most glory to God. So being confessional means we are concerned first and foremost uh, with worship. How worship is regulated by scripture and then fanning out how church governance is also uh, regulated by that same word. I think another characteristic of what it means to be confessional is that we are concerned about covenants. Uh, at to 38 and 39, the promises for you and for your children and for those who are far off. And I think that last section we, we've sort of forgotten about. <laughs> but we, we're, we're handing down the deposit to the next generation, aren't we? So there's organic growth within our churches. There must be, even within a church plant setting, through, through having children. And, and there's a connectiveness as we wrestle together as ministers and elders uh, and, and laypersons in terms of what it means to, to be church. I love the fact that we are Presbyterian in our church governance, which is a function of covenant, being a covenant community. Another characteristic of what it means to be confessionally reformed is having a pilgrim mentality. We're exiles, aren't we? And so we see ourselves as needy, as those who are carrying a burden. And so we see the Lord's Day in particular as an oasis for our souls, where we come uh, as beggars, empty hands built up, and then we turn, don't we, and serve our neighbor with our gifts. First and foremost within the covenants community, then we go out in our vocations and we love our neighbor, we bear witness to the gospel. Now if I could sum at this point up, in terms of what it means to be uh, confessionally reformed, big picture. It's a churchly expression of what it means to be a disciple. It's a churchly expression of piety, and it centers around corporate worship. Now, drilling down, my, my claim right at the beginning was the Great, Co- Great Commission must be unpacked uh, in terms of the keys to the kingdom of heaven and the three marks of a true church. Now, the keys to the kingdom can invoke, it is a contested, controversial idea, but it's right there in our confessional standards, isn't it? Lord's Day 31 of the Heidelberg, I won't read it now, you can take a look at it. And there, what is cited is chapters 16 through 18 of Matthew, and then I think that ties in with Matthew 28. God gave the, the keys to the kingdom to the disciples, the apostles, Whatever they bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever is loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. And, and we see the ordinary calling of minister to be in that line of, of the apostles in terms of the, our, ordained, uh, our ordained office. Again, I don't have the time to unpack that. I'm just assuming that. But it's this idea that, that God is at work through the preaching of the word sacraments administered, and church discipline. It is through through those means, simple, ordinary, foolish to the world, that God opens and closes heaven. 
the age to come breaks in upon this present evil age in a, in a special way, unlike any other time. God meets with us. Now, how do I tie this to the marks of the church? Well, I think it's quite, quite simple. The three marks of the church, just briefly, are the faithful preaching of the word, due administration of the sacraments, three, the exercise of church discipline. And I think a way of bringing this all together, and this is not my insight, I'm, 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 I'm really paraphrasing Michael Horton here, there is no mission, there's no great commission, there's no church planting without the marks of a true church, which is the exercise of the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And so putting it another way, the mission of the church is to execute the marks of the church, which are the same as the keys to the kingdom. And, and where do those marks, those keys cluster around? It clusters around the Lord's Day, where we gather for corporate worship. That is the center of our life as believers. It's the banquet where we feast. and We receive God's gifts, and then what do we do? Well, in accordance with Heidelberg Catechism, Q&A 32, Q&A 55, we turn around and we love our neighbor within the church. Office bearers as well as laypersons who still bear the threefold office of Jesus Christ, who have gifts to, to serve the body. And then as we go out through the, through the week, we bear witness to this gospel. And, 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 and I think this is where we've got a lot of work to do. And tomorrow I'll be preaching at the church plant on hospitality. I think it's an area where we, we, we can grow a lot. How do we go after the lost sheep if we're not having them in our homes and earning the right to speak to them? How can we go after the straying sheep within our congregation if we don't sit face to face with them, develop trust, vulnerability over a meal, over coffee? And so please don't, don't misunderstand me here. There are caricatures of this idea of, well, it's all about church governance. It's all about word and sacraments, all about the Lord's Day and so on as if we don't care about the broader body life of the church. But certainly that's not the case. It, it, it must be having received, and, and we must be there to receive God's gifts according to his means, and the form and the substance must be there. Then we turn in love and service to our neighbor. One final point on this, this head. There's no cleavage, there's no division between the ministry of the church and the mission of the church. I think we need to bring that together. And perhaps we, you know, the traditionalists, the cold clinical intellectualists, if you want to even call it that, then that, they've all been about, you know, getting everything well oiled. Um, but perhaps guilty of losing sight of the gospel. Because if the gospel has gripped you, <laughs> you're going to be concerned about mission. I mean, I don't know how that cannot happen. And so we, at the, so we mustn't be choosing between two alternatives, the maintenance of the church and the mission of the church. No, we, we must be concerned about both. My final point now, how do we gauge the growth and success of a church plant. Well, I hope that, that I'm sort of now just going to fill in the gaps a little bit in light of what I spoke to in my first point and, and my second point and what, what Thomas has already said. I think that the kind of fruit that the world is looking for, and remember that the world does come into the church, doesn't it? We have false teachers, unfortunately, and we have Christians who are uh, at various stages of sanctification. But I think that a way of describing the, those kinds of things that we don't want to see is a theology of glory. Perhaps you've heard that before. That's Martin Luther. Uh, and, and, I, and I think it's encapsulated quite nicely for us in Belgic Article 29. I'll read it to you. I'm, please don't mishear me. I'm not saying that, that if you see any of these traits, it's automatically a false church. But, but these are, this is under the heading of what is a false church. And I think 
it's sobering for us to consider that these, these indeed are the things that, that will be there in a church lacking the three marks. The false church assigns more authority to itself and its ordinances than the word of God. It does not want to subject itself to the yoke of Christ. It does not administer the sacraments as Christ commanded in his word. It rather adds to them or subtracts from them as it pleases. It bases itself on men more than on Jesus Christ. And it persecutes those who live holy lives according to the word of God and who rebuke it for its faults, greed, and idolatry. I think if you consider the disciples early on, I'm preaching through Matthew at the moment, well, I have been for actually years now, Um, (laughs) it's been slow going, but you see the disciples time and time again being guilty of selfish ambition, self-centeredness, wanting heaven on their terms, just think of the Mount of Transfiguration, I mean, what in the world was Peter thinking when he was talking about building tents for Moses and Elijah and Jesus himself, I mean, he thought glory had arrived on that mountain. Uh, so it was according to his, his uh, reading of history, according to his imagination and not God's. You see the competition among the disciples. Uh, you see uh, this desire among the Old Testament saints. You think of a golden calf, uh, but, but also what happened in places like Colossae. Wanting an unmediated encounter with God. You know, let's, bypass all, let's even bypass Jesus and just go straight to the Holy Spirit. Let's bypass the forms and the structures that God is employ, desires to employ through his word and spirit to meet with us. You might think of the Corinthians, and I think the Corinthians were sort of your proto-liberals in a sense, or proto-progressives, uh, in that they, they were all about style over substance. Uh, they were all about, you know, we must hire the... the a preacher with golden lips, a golden tongue at least, and they had a party spirit, they were steeped in Greek culture, and they were enamored with rhetoric and so on. And it's not surprising then that the gauges for success then, if one is coming with a theology of glory, if one is coming with a worldly agenda, is to have a method that employs measurable categories. Techniques that produce results. And then you would have a, a model that's more, again, fashioned after our pop culture. You know, in post-industrial revolution uh, setting, you would have a marketing model, a business model. The church or the pastor as your personal trainer, for example. And, and, you could, and unfortunately, what can end up happening is sort of seeing churches and, and pastors as more like... Uh, Strip miners exploiting nature, the earth, to get what they can out and, and, and make a profit. Here are some examples of wa- ways that a theology of glory would gauge success. Focusing on numbers only. I'm not saying numbers is unimportant, but numbers only. Programs, the fixation with having the kind of programs that are going to attract people. You know, outward displays of emotion in worship uh, without considering the content of worship. Social influence and moral crusading. Pragmatism and the bottom line. You know, having influence and fame. You think of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They wanted to make sure people saw them praying on the street corner, seeing them tithe. You know, they wanted to see their face on the front page of the newspaper. An upbeat, positive thinking vibe within the church. Now, how about uh, what, what would be considered to be biblical indicators of church growth or success? And I think here we must look through the lens of a theology of the cross. And I think Paul sets that out for us beautifully in 1 Corinthians 1 and 2. Obviously, he does so in other places. But I think it presupposes some very important doctrines, among them being the holiness of God, the sovereignty of God. God's ways are inscrutable, aren't they? His ways are not our ways. His ways are beyond finding out. 
God is the sovereign, uh, transcendent one, holy other than us, our covenant Lord. We, his covenant people, mortal, finite. And he has determined, hasn't he, how the church will be governed. And he has determined who the elect are. And he will see to it that those elect will come into the church and be redeemed and discipled according to his means. Just last night I was reading Psalm 46 verse 10 and it just struck me as, as being so applicable here. As we think about God and his might, his majesty. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. So it's with that, that big view of God and, 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 and a suspicion of ourselves as sinners when it, when it comes to thinking about church and, and how we might go about fulfilling the Great Commission, we are to see things through a cruciform lens, which I think is what Paul is setting forth for us in 1 Corinthians 1 and 2. So how has God promised to work? I mean, in a word, he's promised to work through weak and foolish means. The content of our message is considered foolishness to the world. It's offensive. It is Christ and him crucified. The medium of our message, you might hear you thinking of word and sacrament, church governance, it is weak and seemingly ineffective. I mean, think about Paul as, as, as the deliverer of the gospel. I mean, he was not an impressive guy to look at. And he, wasn't, he didn't think he was a very good speaker either. And he came with fear and much trembling to, to the churches. And yet God was willing to use that broken vessel, treasure in jars of clay. And then we might think of the recipients as well. They were low and despised. They were not the movers and shakers of the world back then. You might think of Paul, uh, Jesus' call to us as believers to take up our cross and follow him in a life of self-denial. Well, I tell you, the world is not going to think that that is cool. You know, us bearing the weight of the burden of suffering so that we might be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. My point being here, that we must see through a lens of suffering and the cross. That has to shape our approach to church planting. That it extinguishes the theology of glory in us. But we're so prone, that's our default, to keep on going back uh, to man-made thinking, man-made techniques, and so on. So I think the apostolic method or technique for us is summed up in Acts 2.42. What did they do? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, into fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. That's essentially the four elements of uh, a worship service. And so this technique, again, centers around organic growth that comes through handing down the deposit to the next generation. Certainly, you're going to have uh, those who come in as, as, as converts, and, and then, Lord willing, they, they end up, you know, if they're not married already, having children of their own. And, and there's this, this covenantal succession alongside of uh, the, the incoming and inflow of new converts. We can describe this model, yes, as covenantal. And I like the analogy here of farming. I mean, it's obviously very germane to Scripture, the notion of the shepherd and the sheep and the sort of agrarian personal contact that the minister and the elders have with the sheep. Again, willingness to go out after the straying sheep, but also after the lost. And I think that that, mod that, that model is so important for us in, in view of the, the models that are vying for our attention coming in from the world. Now, a couple of indicators of success. And, and I think these indicators, I'm, I'm, I'm emphasizing the objective nature of them. Uh, the first uh, would be a perseverance in commitment to the three marks of a true church. The Great Commission says we are to obey all those things that Christ has commanded us. Are we following all that God commands? When it comes to worship, are we worshiping according to his word? And are we approaching the one 
who is described in Hebrews 12 as a consuming fire with gladness and joy, but also with reverence and awe. Are we engaging in those tedious commitments to corporate and family worship, private prayer, and so on and so forth? Is there the objective fruits of the Spirit in our lives? Galatians 5. Are we behaving like pilgrims and exiles? Is it evidence that we're denying ourselves of the fleeting pleasures of sin in this life? So I think what we have in the confessional approach to church planting, uh, the, the, reform, the best of the reformed tradition is growth that is qualitative and lasting. And I think on this point we need to encourage one another because most of us are ministering, if we're in a church plant, it's small. It starts off small and it can be small for quite a period of time. Belgic 27 reminds us not to be discouraged if the church sometimes for a while appears very small and in the eyes of men reduced to nothing. God will renew us. He will see to it that the, rem the remnants comes in and is discipled into worshipers of God. Tying it all together now, what, again, why does this matter? Well, it matters because uh, we have to be concerned about the Great Commission, which means we have to be concerned about church planting and mission. And, and I believe we, I'm, I'm, I think we're biased here. I think we have uh, the richest commentary on the Word of God in the best of the Reformed tradition. And so let's spread that wealth in the English medium, but also Afrikaans and other uh, language mediums. And, and, and let us do so in a way that is faithful to the Word. It is tempting uh, to be pragmatic. It's tempting to accommodate the Gospel for results, especially when the pressures of finances, dwindling numbers and influences there. But let us unite around the cross together as fellow pilgrims. Humble ourselves and let us reject uh, the, the bad stuff of pietism and revivalism. Reject the bad stuff of a cold traditionalism, a fundamentalism. And let's be about uh, the three marks of a true church through the exercises, exercise of the keys to the kingdom, which, which will turn our people into to service as they go out and witness to that same gospel. I think this is a good time just to get you thinking so that we can come back to it in the Q&A. Here are some outcomes that, that perhaps could result from this conference. One is what Thomas has already mentioned, and that is let's go back to our churches and our councils and let us be catalysts for this vision of church planting. Second, let us consider perhaps going uh, to, to our church, plant, church growth deputies and speak through the possibility of adopting or formulating our own church planting manual. I've based my, uh, my, my address on one particular church planting manual. Uh, perhaps I think it would be a good idea if we, we considered this. Perhaps we should have an ongoing uh, space for us to engage one another, debate, discuss what we've been talking about this morning in a quarterly Skype conference, uh, something of that nature. Maybe we want uh, this topic to be at, on the table of the next Chiatia uh, Fear for our denomination. Uh, let us think through what would be good topics for our next multicultural church planting conference. Perhaps contextualization. Uh, perhaps uh, the whole idea of style in worship. What about social justice? And so on and so forth. So let's get thinking. Let's keep the conversation going. Uh, let's be proactive uh, for God's glory.